All right, so it's great to see you all. As always, um, I will not torture you with a joke this time. We'll get straight to it because uh, I'm starting three minutes late, so we skipped the time for the joke, so sorry about that. I'm sure you're all devastated. But um, uh, this week's chapter is a culmination of everything we've been discussing till now. And we, we're studying chapter 12. In fact, in uh, Hasidic circles, Chabad Hasidic circles, I should say, um, for many years it was customary that children at their bar mitzvah would know the first 12 chapters of the Tanya by heart. So let me close that door. So I'm going to say again, it used to be it was customary that children would know the first 12 chapters of Tanya by heart. Why? Because they are the foundation of everything that's in the Tanya. It's kind of like saying, you know, you should study the, the Chumash by heart, right? You get the foundation for all Judaism. Studying the first 12 chapters of the Tanya gives you the foundation for understanding the underpinnings of the rest of the Tanya. So even though uh, the actual first 12 chapters don't necessarily tell you how to serve God, although it's in there as a side point, but the first 12 chapters are the underpinnings. And I would like to say that the first 12 chapters, even I would call the thesis of the Tanya. The Tanya is building up its thesis based on which the rest of the Tanya is established. And the thesis is pretty much based on understanding who we are and understanding um, the definitions of righteous, wicked, and intermediate or in-betweener. And those definitions are just ways of describing what is going on inside of your body. So the real important point is not your definition. In fact, the Tanya tells you not to focus on your definition to an extent, right? In other words, if you don't study the Tanya, you may think someone who's righteous is someone who does mostly good things. And then you may walk away from life saying, well, you know, I, I do mostly good things. So, you know what? I'm good. I'm good where I am. I'm mostly good. So I'm a tzaddik. I'm righteous. The Tanya tells you, no, that's 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 not a tzaddik, first of all. A tzaddik is something much greater than that. Um, second of all, of course, more importantly, is that the names righteous, wicked, intermediate is really just a description of what's going on inside of you. And you have to learn what is happening inside of you. And serving God literally means, as Atanya will say a little bit later, in more clear words, serving God literally means serving God. It's not about how many righteous deeds you've done or where you're at. It's about serving God. And serving God really means pushing yourself every single day. That's what serving God means is going a little bit further, pushing yourself to do a little bit more. So even if you are, so to speak, fully righteous, doing all good things all day, if you can push yourself to do more and you're not, then you're not serving God. You might be righteous, but life is not about being righteous or wicked. It's about serving God. So a tzaddik, someone who's completely righteous, has to serve God in their way. And a rasha, a wicked person, which as we described last week, is probably most of us. We have to serve God in our way. The main purpose and point though is to be serving god at every single moment or i should say whenever possible okay uh, that's really what the tanya is about and so in order to understand what it means to serve god we we described <clears throat> who we are we described our inner workings we described we're not going to be exotic so chapter 12 is going to really take everything we learned and it's going to tell us what is possible for us to do even if we're not going to reach the, the height of that it's going to tell us what is within our limits, right? We we discovered what a tzaddik was. We knew that's not us, right? We we discovered what a rasha is. We know that we are currently wicked, right? In other words, we we allow our evil inclination to overcome ourselves. Now we're going to learn what is, so to speak, our pinnacle. What's the highest place that we, non sadics non-righteous people, what's the highest place that we can reach? Even if we're never going to get there, it, it tells us the limitations of our inner workings and what we can strive towards in life. And that is going to be today's discussion, describing what's known as the intermediate, meaning the person who is not a tzaddik, not fully righteous, and we said fully righteous means they've gotten rid of their evil inclination, but yet nevertheless, um, what is the pinnacle of such a person? And uh, based on this, we will um, discover uh, the much meaning in our own personal lives. Um so before we read the first sec first part of chapter 12, it's important to note what we've said till now. We've said till now we have two souls, and both of those two souls have 10 powers, three intellectual, seven emotional. And then we have the garments, the thoughts, the speech, and the action. And we discussed how the 
uh, the powers of the soul are non-interchangeable. They're they're part of your soul. They're part of the fabric of your soul. Your soul's powers can change over time. It's a longer term thing. Your garments, though, can easily be changed just as your clothing you can change. Garments technically can be changed at will. So at will, you can change what you're doing. In other words, you can do from one moment a really wicked thing to the next moment a really righteous thing. We also discussed how there's a war going on. And uh, both the godly soul and the animalistic soul want full control. They want to be at the seat running the show on your body, and controlling your thought, speech, and action. Um, so last week we discussed a wicked person. What is a wicked person? A wicked person is, again, not, not, to, not to get depressed about being called wicked. We discussed that last week. We're not going to go over that. But a wicked person technically meant someone who does, uh, who, who is... Um, who sometimes the godly soul is in control, sometimes the animalistic soul is in control. That's why we say us wicked people were full of regret. Why are we full of regret? It's a, it's a sign that we have the godly soul, the animal soul, and sometimes the godly soul wins. And when the animal soul wins and the godly soul comes back, we are full of regret. That's what happens. We're full of regret. Um that, that's a sign, as I said, that's actually a healthy sign. Regret is actually, to an extent, a healthy sign that means that um, we uh, have a go the godly souls coming back in control. That's actually a good thing, okay? So if we have the righteous person is the one who the godly soul is in full control, the wicked person is the one who the godly soul is in partial control, what is the intermediate person, right? So the intermediate person cannot be someone who has partial control to both because we just discussed that last week. That's what a wicked person is. A wicked person is sometimes the godly soul, sometimes the, the wicked soul, right? You can't. So what is an in-between in person? So this is what the Tanya is going to describe over here. What is an in-between person? And uh, we're going to get, as we describe what an in-between person is, we're going to get to a very important, powerful tool that is written in a tanya to help us in our lives and our self-control. All right, so it says like this. If you have the book, page 137 at the bottom. The Bainini, the in-betweener. As you may notice, by the way, the name of the book is called The In-Betweener. So, section one. And now that we have clarified the different levels of tzaddikim, the righteous people who have succeeded at self-mastery, and rishaim, wicked people who fail at self-mastery, they're, they're sometimes in control, sometimes not, which means they don't have full self-mastery. We can turn our attention to the elusive category, the Bainini, the in-betweener. Let's uh, turn the page. And great to see you, Baruch and David. All right. In chapter one, we already demonstrated that the Bainini, like the Tzaddik, never actually commits a sin. That is why Rabbah, who was a Tzaddik, was able to misidentify himself as a Bainini. So this goes back, as I said many times, the time is written both for a scholar and a lay person. And so this is giving us, this, that's telling us the scholarly underpinnings uh, of proving his thesis. But here's the important point for us. The Bainini, the intermediate person, which as we'll find out, we may or may not be, is a person whose evil never gains enough momentum to conquer the small city to influence the body to sin. So remember, the in-betweener is a step up from the wicked person. If the wicked person is someone who sometimes has control of the godly soul, sometimes has control of the animal soul, it must mean that the in-between person, who is greater than a wicked person, never allows control to the animalistic soul. Okay? Now, you may ask right away, so then why is he not righteous? We'll get to that in a moment. This means that the three garments of the animal soul, which are thought, speech, and action of Klipa, never overcome the divine soul within him, so as to become dressed in his body, brain, mouth, or other anatomy anatomical parts, which total 248, causing them to sin and be defiled, God forbid. So again, your, the, the Bainini, the in-between, is a step above the wicked. That means he never allows control of his thought, speech, and action, his garments, as we call them, to the animal soul. And as he continues, only the three garments of the divine soul, they alone influence the body namely the thought, speech, and action of the Torah's 613 mitzvot. 
externally at the level of garments, the bain is identical to tzaddik. So what he means is on the level of action. So this is the difference between the wicked and the intermediate. At the level of thought, speech, and action, meaning thinking deeply about sinning or saying evil talk or doing an actual sin, the bainini, the in-between person, does not sin, right? If we say he has control over the city, that means such a person is not sinning, okay? So he is not allowing, he or her is not allowing themselves to sin, okay? That's what a, that's what a bainini is. Now he's going to say another interesting thing. You know, we tend to think of control as a moment, right? Self-control means that I can control myself in the moment. I have self-control. I can control myself. But for someone to really say they have self-control, in other words, I cannot honestly say I have self-control if I can only contain myself so much, right? So in other words, I, I may have a pop some self-control, but I cannot truly say I have a real self-control if I'm tempted with more. So let me bring an example. Let's say I, I could say I have self-control um, not to eat, um, uh, let's say, um, you know, a chocolate Danish, right? Because chocolate Danishes are good. But if you offer me a custard donut, maybe I can't control myself. Even if I'm on a diet, I'll eat it, right? What that means is that I have some self-control, but I do not have full, I do not have complete self-control. Um, are you, is everybody following? Am I, am I still here? Cause it gave me a message about being a uh, low system. Am I, I hope I'm not frozen. Anybody confirm I'm not frozen. You're fine. I'm fine. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. So self-control if I were to say I'm a person that has self-control, for it to be 100% true, that would mean I can control myself in every situation. That means I have reached a point that I am totally in control of myself. Okay? That's what it would mean. Uh, I'll give another example. There's a story told of uh, Maimonides. Maimonides had a debate with the... Um, philosophers of his day. It's a story they tell a legend, whether it's true or not. Uh, uh, some people say it happened to Rabbianus and Ibschitz, regardless who it happened with. Again, it's a legend. The story is told that there was a debate. Can we train animals to have self-control? And so uh, the philosopher said yes, and they took a cat and they trained it to be a waiter. They got it dressed up in a tuxedo and it was able to carry the food. And, um, you know, so they made this big dinner where the king was there, Maimonides or Venus and Ipsis, whichever rabbi was, was there. And the philosophers were there, and the philosophers are kind of proving their point. Look, this cat, we trained it. It's got full self-control. It can be fully trained. It's like a person now. It's serving. It's a waiter. And uh, then the rabbi said, watch this. And he pulls out of his pocket the little cage. He opens up a, a mouse, jumps out of the cage, and the cat drops all the food and runs after the mouse. His point was that you can train it to a certain extent, but uh, you can never fully train an animal. Human beings, we believe, can be fully trained. Okay. Now, I don't know that any of us here on this on this call are fully trained, but um, this is the idea that a bainani is someone who has full self control. He is completely in control. Going back to the example the Alter Rebbe brings of a war of an army in a city. If you have control over a city, that means you have control over the city. It's not that you allow little incursions, right? Right now, there's a, a peace, there's a truce between Hamas and Israel, right? And, um, you know, Hamas apparently set off a bomb today or something. That means you're not fully in control, or there's not, that means it's not really fully peace, right? <laughs> peace means there's peace, and control means control. So, control over yourself means that you are currently, you are currently at a place where nothing in the world can stop you. You are so inspired, so elevated. Um, you, your mind is so powerful that um, you are in complete self-control. And al Rabbi describes this as a person who has never sinned and will never sin. What that means is not necessarily this person never sinned and will never sin, but it means they right now are in a moment where any sins they've done in the past are not really them because they've elevated themselves to a greater place. 
and sins in the future are completely out of play because the place where they're at right now, they're in a, a very elevated status where they're in complete control and they don't identify themselves with their former self or any self in the future that may sin. So this is what he means. Because this is a complicated line of the Tanya. People want to know what does it mean? A Bainini, an intermediate person, is someone who's never sinned and will never sin. It doesn't mean that he may never sin. It doesn't mean he never sinned before. What it means is he's at a place, or he or she is at a place, where they are in complete self-control, where past sins are not attributed to them because that they sinned because of the because of the control they had then, but not where they are now. And future sins are also out of place because where they are now, they they, they feel like they would never sin. So let's read this. Once he has reached a level of a bainani, intermediate, it is as if he has never committed any transgressions in his life because any trace of prior sins have been wiped away through repentance. And at his current level, we can reason be reasonably assured that he will never transgress in the future. And we can be confident that even for a moment, a single second of his life, he will never involve himself in an activity that would cause him to be categorized as a rush, a wicked person. And what makes someone a rush, a wicked person? is by ceding some control of your thought, your speech, and your action. For example, in chapter one, we learned that even if a person himself does not sin, but he could have prevented someone else from sinning and failed to do so, he's classified as a rush of the beginning avoids this type of activity too. So again, this is a person who's um, just amazing, has such amazing self-control. Now, I want to point to the word that I'm saying, self-control. Self-control means that you're controlling yourself. That means you have a desire to do otherwise and you are choosing not to. That's the definition of self-control. If you have no desire, you don't have any self-control, right? I don't have to have self-control to uh, not eat dog food, right? I have no desire to eat dog food, animal food, right? It, it, it doesn't, it's not self-control, right? Um, that, that That's just not within my league. So this is really going to be the main difference between a tzaddik, a righteous person, and an intermediate person. We're describing here an intermediate person who has complete dominance and self-control. But self-control itself implies he has a desire to do otherwise. He just, he is so inspired, he is so elevated, that regardless of what desires come up to him, he shoots them down because he's in complete control. It's like a, it's like you're in a war. You have control of the city. The enemies keep coming to the city and you, you, you know, you shoot them down. They, they can never get close, right? They get, or they get close, but they can never breach. They never get in. The Bainini is someone who has complete self-control, but that word self-control itself implies that he has to be controlling something. What is he controlling? That desire. He's controlling the evil inclination that keeps rearing its ugly head. A tzaddik has gotten rid of their evil inclination, either completely getting rid of it, as we described, or by completely subduing it. The Benoni is someone who still has the evil inclination, but is in complete control and completely controls that that evil inclination, despite its desires and attempts, will never gain control over the spe over the thought, the speech, and the action. When I say, by the way, it never gains control over thought, I mean to continuously think. Okay, so again, as I've said a couple other times, when a moment of anger arises in your mind, that's not a sin. It's choosing to wallow in the anger, that's the sin. When a moment of a thought of revenge or jealousy or any bad thoughts that come to our mind, the first moment is not a sin. You are not in control of that. What is a sin is the choice that you make to wallow and stay with that. And on this, a Benini is in control. Benini is not in control of the enemy keep trying to get in. But the Benini is in control of not allowing that entity to ever take control. So a Benini, intermediate person, may have thoughts of doing bad. They may come to his or her mind, but they're shot down right away. That's what a Benini is. That's what it means, complete self-control. Let's um, uh, turn the page. All right, and this is what he this is so now he explains exactly what I just said, right? In other words, how does a Bainuni differ? How does the intermediate person differ from the tzaddik from the righteous person? So he, this is what he says over here. I'm gonna skip the first paragraph. As far as the garments are concerned, meaning the thought, the speech, and the action, the Bainuni, the intermediate person resembles the tzaddik, resembles the righteous person. 
Both the Benoni, the intermediate person, and the Tzaddik have achieved a level of self-mastery where garments will always be controlled exclusively by the divine soul. It is in the area of the soul's powers that the Benoni and the Tzaddik differ significantly, as Atanya will now explain. As he says, however, in the case of the Benoni, the intermediate person, the divine soul's deep core, which is its ten powers of intellect and emotion, are not the only forces attempting to direct and dominate the city. So as he says, important, he says, are not the only forces attempting to direct and dominate the city. With a tzaddik, there's no attempt by other forces to direct the city. By intermediate person, there are other forces, but he doesn't allow control. Let's read what he says. As we learn in chapter 9, I'm reading this because this is a repetition of what I said, so it brings home what we spoke about. The war between the divine and the animal souls initially act itself out in the heart. The divine soul whose influence emerges on the right side of the heart wants its feelings for God to overflow into the left side of the heart. Where the animal soul's emotion of self-gratification emerge, each soul desires to saturate the heart completely. In the case of the tzaddik, the divine soul's goal has been achieved and the animal soul has been silenced completely. But with the bainani, the intermediate person, the conflict remains. At an emotional level, the Benini is still torn between love of God and desire for self-gratification. Though he has achieved enough self-mastery not to allow these feelings to surface behaviorally in any way. While externally the Tzaddik and the Benin appear identical, their inner life is likely to be quite different. The Tzaddik exists in a state of inner peace. That's an important word, inner peace. His whole being singularly devoted to God. For him, worship is innate and natural. The Benini, on the other hand, lives of inner tension with his heart tugged by strong forces in opposing directions. For him, worship remains strongly disciplined practice to contain his inner negativity and selfish drives, preventing him from surfacing at any moment. Now, by the way, people, even if we are not fully to the extent of the bane and knee, even when we act righteously, we may often, even when we're doing the right thing, we may be feeling the struggle of the bane and knee. Even when I'm choosing the right actions, even when I'm studying, even when I'm praying, even when I'm doing the right things, I may still feel like the bane and knee. I may not have the inner peace that the tzaddik has. I may constantly feel a struggle. I may be making the right choices most of the time. But even when I make those choices, I may still be struggling inside. And you know what? You might wonder to yourself, why does God make it so difficult? Why does God make it such a struggle? The Tanya will address that question later. But what we get from here is that there are people in their lives who will struggle their entire lives. We said in previous chapter, being a tzaddik is a gift. That means if we are not gifted with the gift of becoming a tzaddik, it's very possible that our entire lives we will struggle. In other words, there's no end game to an extent, right? In other words, you hope one day you struggle, struggle long enough, you finally get rid of your, your animal soul. No, you never get rid of it. It's very possible you and I and all of us here will live an entire lifetime full of struggle. The entire life. And you cry out to God, why make it so difficult? Later chapters will discuss, discuss that. But what you get from here is that the struggle is part of us. Now, I do have to say, of course, as you progress in your service of God, your struggles may change. In other words, when just like diets, right? When you're at a very low level, it's, it's, a, it's a question of eating, uh, of eating a donut or not eating a donut. As you get better in your diet, it may be a question of eating a healthier salad dressing or a less healthy salad dressing. You know, similarly, in our divine service of God, uh, maybe the beginning struggle is between pork and not pork. And then as we progress further, maybe in our kosher or in our studies, again, it's all arenas. It's just kosher is always a simple one, but there's all different arenas in our study and our prayer and our devotion and our commandments. There's always higher. There's always more. So there's always a struggle. There's always a struggle. And that struggle will remain with us for life. But now that Tanya tells us, but you should know. You should know that although you may be subject to struggling your entire life, you should know you may also have moments of peace in your life. So although, yes, generally we're born possibly to struggle, and we'll describe later on in Tanya why. It's not so far later, by the way. It's in the next couple chapters. We discussed the Bainley at length in these next couple chapters. Nevertheless, you should know it's possible for us to have moments of respite, moments of peace. And this is what Tanya is going to describe now as... A Benoni, an intermediate person who has tzaddik like moments. What is pretty much the definition of a tzaddik? Someone who has inner peace who does not feel any desires to do bad. We also in our lives have tzaddik like moments. They generally come at very elevated spiritual times. Maybe it's 
on Yom Kippur. Maybe it's at the Passover Seder. There are moments in our life where we feel an inner peace. There are far and few in between. We can probably create more of those moments. But we do have those moments. And those moments, I would say, are moments of clarity. And more importantly, more than moments of clarity, they're also moments which give us the strength to carry on during the struggle. You know, if we never have those moments of clarity, it's very hard to remain strong in the moments when it's difficult, right? So just think about someone who's dieting. In the moment of, of war, of, of that donut there, it's hard to lose sight of what, what's needed to be done because ah, just one donut, what's so bad? They have to have those moments of clarity when they're not struggling that gives them the power and the impetus to move on. Or, you know, when people go to synagogue and they get inspired maybe by the rabbi's sermons or jokes, right? Um, so you, that inspiration carries you into your day-to-day -day life. Or when you're studying a Tanya class, you get inspired. Those moments of inspiration are moments of clarity when you're not feeling the inner strife. And you carry that with you to the rest of your day. And so we're going to discover now that this Benini, this intermediate person, has these moments of inner peace. And these moments of inner peace are so important for the Benini and for us as well. Because these moments of inner peace give us the strength to carry through the struggle. So let us now read one of these moments, as the Tanya describes it. For example, prayer. During prayer, if you're like a Benoni and you really, really pray to God and you really concentrate, you know, oftentimes we read the prayers and we go really quick, you know. Okay, maybe I go really quick. Maybe you don't go really quick. <laughs> but, you know, um, if we truly prayed, those moments of prayer can be moments of clarity, moments of inner peace, moments when we feel very connected to God. That's why we pray in the morning usually, before the world gets chaotic, before the world gets crazy. We take, take our moments to pray to God, we connect with him, and we feel that inner peace. And then we start our day. Shabbos, by the way, is to an extent, a little bit of a day of inner peace as well, right? Shabbos, we, we have a rest from the rest of the world. I always know, like after I do Havdalah, like the world comes back at me with a vengeance. All the clarity that was there in Shabbos, suddenly things become confusing. Doubt. Doubt seeps in. But we need those moments of clarity to help us carry through those moments of doubt. So let's read over here. The Benini who feels like a tzaddik, that means the Benini who feels moments of clarity, is the way I'm translating it. There are times, however, when the Benini does enjoy inner peace, and the urges of her animal of his animal soul are temporarily quieted. Quiet, quiet tin, quiet timed. Okay, so sorry. Uh, tongue, tongue twisted over here. Okay. Except on particular occasions, meaning he's saying a Benini can sometimes feel moments of inner peace, such as when performing the mitzvah of reading the Shema or when at prayer. The focused meditation of the Shema prayer can temporarily generate such emotion from the divine soul on the right side of the heart that the Benini's animal soul on the left side is totally overwhelmed. Now he's going to explain here that there's actually a spiritual phenomenon behind um, the power during prayer. In other words, it's not just because you're taking focused time to think about God, but there's actually spiritual divine energy during the times of prayer that allow us to get that moments of inner peace. So this is what he says, because this is a time of expanded consciousness of the supernal mind. According to Kabbalah, your mind is influenced by the state of the supernal mind at any given moment. When the output signal above is more intense, your soul can pick it up more easily below in this world. Right, that's why we find sometimes we find inspiration easier, sometimes we find it harder. This, by the way, explains why the holidays are important to be done on the holidays itself, right? Why is it important to eat matzah on Pesach? If the whole idea of Passover is to commemorate the exodus of Egypt, what's wrong if I do it a day or two earlier? What if my family can only get together a day or two earlier? What's wrong? Well, nothing wrong. It's a nice thing. But on the holiday is when certain spiritual energies are available. And so if you're going to celebrate Passover, not on Passover, you're going to miss out the ability to tap into those special spiritual energies. And so here's an example of that as well. When we pray, not only is prayer effective because we're concentrating, but there's actually a spiritual energy that's available to us that allows us that moment of inner peace and control. So he says like this, if the supernal mind is broad and flowing, mochen de godless, you'll find it easier to take principles that you believe in your heart. If the supernal mind is constricted, mochen de katnas, your cognitive powers will still be functional. 
but you will find it harder to take good ideas and make them real and relevant to your life using the faculty of Das. So again, you can always meditate about God, but if you meditate about God during the times of prayer, uh, you'll, you'll be, you have a higher de- chance and degree of success because of the spiritual energies that are flowing. I'm not going to explain in detail right now the spiritual meaning of mochin, the godless, the supernal mind, and the expansiveness of the supernal mind. It'll confuse us at this moment. But the general idea we understand that at times of prayer, particularly the morning prayer, which we spoke about in our JLI class, the last class, right? The morning, in the morning, there's a, a certain shine, a spiritual shine. In the morning, there's a, a, a great possibility to connect with divine expansiveness and our minds can be more expansive and connect to God and gain for us a moment of inner peace. Now he says something very interesting, which explains uh, the difference between temple times in our days. When the temple stood, the supernal mind was in a state of permanent expansiveness. That might explain, by the way, why during temple times, prayer wasn't as mandatory as it is today or as long. Currently, however, it fluctuates during the day, during the morning, a time of invigoration renewal. It flows in a state of expansiveness, but in the afternoon it wanes, becoming constricted in the evening. And he says, therefore, if there's an expansiveness of the supernal mind, when the supernal mind is in a state of expansiveness, it is also an opportune time below for every person to connect his intellectual faculties, Chachman bin Adas to God, to profoundly meditate in the greatness of the infinite one God. To sum up this whole section here that we're describing let's read the hasidic thought my inner core is unrefined leaving me to have a mixture of urges towards personal gratification and towards god right i'm unrefined i have all different types of urges that come to me and even if i'm sometimes in control of even if i'm a bain and in control of myself they still come at me but if i focus my mind on the shaman on the prayer at the time when the supernal mind is in a state of expansiveness I will experience a temporary flooding of emotions for God that my urge for self-gratification will be temporarily silenced. And as I said, that moment of temporarily silence gives you the power to um, overwhelm and overcome uh, your... um, gives you the moment of clarity so that later on, uh, those moments of clarity will help you later on. Um, For some reason, this is not... Let me uh, refresh the pictures. Let's go back here. I don't have the next page up. Okay, let's see. Um, okay. Got to go back and drop here. Sorry, went too far. I were on page 141. Let's get there. Okay, so he's continuing his thought over here. You know, we explained it, so you got it all, but he's continuing his thought. And that is that uh, when we contemplate about the greatness of God, we thereby arouse the flaming fire of love in the right chamber of your heart, where the divine soul manifests emotionally, to attach himself to God through fulfillment of the Torah mitzvahs out of love. And all this is included in the biblical commandment to read the Shema, as has been clarified by the rabbinic sources. So by the way, he, he he points out in this commentary here that what the Alter Rebbe just described here is what meditation is supposed to look like. And he says like this, there's threefold process of meditation. Is number one, we focus a meditation on God, which number two leads to a emotional arousal, which number three reads, leads to a renewed commitment to observe the commandments. And that's the important part. That's what I was saying a moment ago. Those moments of clarity for those of us who live within our strife, those moments of clarity and emotional arousal towards God allow us to create strong commitments to observe what we want to do, right? Just as, like I said, a dieter. When you get inspired to diet, that arouses within you a strong commitment. And that strong commitment carries you even in your difficult times. Similarly, similarly, um, we through arousing ourselves in prayer by focusing on a meditation of God, allow a arousal of our emotions, which ultimately makes us to commit, right? We are, to an extent, controlled by our emotions. Although our mind controls our heart and can force our heart to do anything, the easiest way to get something done is to get yourself emotionally attached, right? So again, 
we can desire something against, sorry, we can do something against what our emotions tell us to do, right? We can force ourselves to do something, but the, the most straightforward path is to, is to desire it. So in the moments of clarity, we actually desire God. And in those moments of clarity, we make commitments to do the right thing. Just as the moments of clarity about a diet, we make commitments to do the right thing. Now he says over here, something interesting. He says that the meditation about God is not only during the Shema, but it's also the entire prayer service. As he says, this meditative emotional arousal is also the goal of the blessings which precede and follow the Shema, which are required by rabbinic law. Since these readings are aimed at preparing you to fill the biblical commandment of reading the Shema with the proper mindset, as explained elsewhere, right? The Shema says you shall love the Lord your God. We want to make you love God. So we the, 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 the rabbis added more prayers to give us more time to become emotionally connected to God. I want to point out something that I point out very often that... Um, you know, people want to know why the prayer is so long. And one of the explanations given is that um, one of the things that we've been told is that, uh, you know, prayers used to be a lot shorter. The reason they're longer today is because it takes us longer to get to that heightened emotional state. Now, if our prayers were really short, we'd never get to that heightened emotional state and clarity. We need long prayers to give us enough time to finally reach that pinnacle, that point of connection to God. But back in the day, when people were more inspired, divinely inspired, the prayer services were shorter. But today, we need a longer period of time to get to that point. And so this is what the Tanya here is telling us, is that not only the prayer of Shema itself, right? It used to be people would just say the Shema and the Amida. That was all they used to have to say. Now we say the Shema and the blessings of the Shema and the, and the verses of praise and all, and all that. That's all there to give us more time to get to that desire and feeling for God. Let's let's go back inside. Uh, um, okay, so it's like this. So he says, what happens when you awaken yourself, when you feel great emotions towards God, when you're in the middle of prayer, you're this bainani, you're having this tzaddik-like moment. What is happening at that moment? At that time, the evil in the left chamber of the heart, where the animal soul manifests itself, is temporarily suppressed and voided by the good, which spread to the right chamber. So it's a temporary, there's like an overflow, you know, you're, you're, you're flooding, you're flooding your heart with love towards God. So temporarily the animal soul is suppressed. The moment the overflood leaves, it wakes up again. So he says, by the Chochmah, Bina Das, and his brain, which are at a time focused on the greatest of infinite God. Okay. So we have described so far, what is a Benoni? A Benoni is someone who has self-control. Self-control means, as we said, there is an opposing power that is trying constantly to regain control, yet you nevertheless control and make sure that your actions always remain good. Your speech always remains good. And even your thoughts, you never dwell on sinful thoughts. We said, though, you get moments of what this means in essence is that a tzaddik has inner peace, does not have desire to do wrong things. And we do not have inner peace. We're constantly facing a barrage. Even if I am most of the time are always like a Benini making the right choices. I don't have inner peace. However, I do have moments of clarity. In those moments of clarity, what is happening in those moments of clarity, my love for God is so overwhelming that the animalistic soul, is the system, its system is, so to speak, overwhelmed and it falls asleep. But be rest assured, the moment you're done, the moment the inspiration dies down, it'll wake up right there, right? I think we've all experienced this. Anybody who ever had a Yom Kippur, uh, you get inspired. And the moment those bagels and oranges come out, um, you know, slowly, you know, that animal soul starts to wake up. Um, you know, so we have we have those moments. Rabbi, but as I said, yes. I have a question. Yes. Uh, I thought that the tzaddik never even had a challenge of dealing with the animal soul. Like, uh, basically, like, like he, if he was born that way, that he wouldn't sin. But we just read that the tzaddik has achieved the divine soul goal and has silenced the animal soul so uh implying that if if, if he silenced it in implied that it was loud at some point so good, good question so the difference between a tzaddik and a non-tzaddik is that a tzaddik has the ability to permanently silence their evil inclination it doesn't mean they didn't start with one it's possible a tzaddik a righteous person started with evil inclination but when they by the time they become a tzaddik that means they've completely either converted their animal soul or completely silenced it okay so again a tzaddik is 
someone who right now has complete silence. It's possible they were born with one, but God gave them the ability to get rid of it. People who are not tzaddiks typically are people who are not born with that ability, which is most of us. The ability to become a tzaddik is a gift from God, but it doesn't mean that they never had it. It could be they had it, but right now they don't have it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. All right. You're welcome. Okay. So this is uh, the story of the Bainani. And like I keep pointing out, the Bainani is to an extent us because we have these moments of self-control. We have these Bainani moments as well to an extent. And so really when we talk about a Bainani, it talks to us as well. Maybe we're not at the full level of the Bainani that we have such self-control that I will never sin and I have never, and I feel like I never would have sinned. But the general lifestyle of the Bainani talks to us and is something that we strive that we strive for and and and, and attempt. So much of what we talk about the Bainani will apply to us, even if we may not be classified as the Bainani. In addition to this, by the way, it's possible we have moments where we're so inspired, we might even feel like a Bainani, right? Just like a, a Bainani has moments where they feel like a tzaddik. In the moments of prayer and rapture, they feel like a tzaddik. We can also feel in moments of prayer like a Bainani and maybe even like a tzaddik. So anyways, um, this is um, be very important and first section. But now we are, um, what page are we on? We're on page 141, right? Um, okay. Let's, uh, let's, anybody has any other questions before I move on, before I continue over here? Questions or comments? Because I think this is a interesting topic. No? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Hopefully that means everything's uh, clear. Okay. All right. So we have said that the Bainini has complete self-control. Now you might be saying to yourself, what's the secret sauce? You know, um, I would love to have self-control. You know, that would sound amazing. You know, and we know that the, that the Bainini, the intermediate person is not with you know, something that's within our reach, technically complete self-control is within our reach, right? We, we only said that it's sadik is completely out of our reach, right? It's a gift from God. But a bainani is not a gift from God. It's within our reach, technically. So what's the bainani's secret sauce? How does he maintain self-control? You know, one of the issues we have with self-control is, is it's very difficult. It's very difficult to maintain self-control the whole time. Uh, I can control myself one day, two days, three days, four days. I keep being faced with the same thing, you know, how, how, uh, how much, uh, you know, how, how long can I, you know, last, you know, they say that, uh, you know, power corrupts and, and absolute power corrupts absolutely or something, right? They, they say that, uh, you know, uh, if someone has power and they're not corrupt, you need to give them more power. Eventually you give them enough power. Eventually, you know, eventually they'll succumb or same thing with money, right? You can force anybody to do anything with money. I don't know if really anybody, but you get the idea, right? It's not, and for some people, it's a hundred dollars. Some people, it's a million dollars. Some people, it's a billion dollars. But uh, generally, people can be bought off, right? It just depends on how much money you need, how much money you need to offer them. Um, so what does that mean? That means we can withstand to a certain extent, but it's very hard to, to always withstand everything that comes our way. Yet the Benoni is someone who is always withstanding uh, what comes his or her way. And the question is, what's the secret? So we gave one secret already. That's the power of prayer. Um, but now we're going to get to the other part of this secret. It's like this. The secret of the Bainani's self-mastery. During prayer, it's the bottom of the page, the Bainani may be devoid of any urge towards self-gratification. So he might come to the mistaken conclusion he has reached the level of the tzaddik. Wait, I read that already, right? Did I read this already? I don't know. I'm, I'm losing my mind over here, right? Okay. No. Um, uh, who has completely eliminated the uh, evil in his heart. This impression, however, will soon be shattered after the experience of prayer has ended and he loses the assistance of the expanded consciousness. Right? So we're, we're trying to tell you that prayer alone is not going to be enough because the moment you finish praying, the expanded consciousness leaves. However, after prayer, when the expanded consciousness of the supernal mind of the blessed infinite light of God departs, the Bainini loses the external assistance of focusing his mind and heart. And consequently, the evil left chamber of his heart re-emerges and awakens. 
leading him to have a desire for temptations of this world and his pleasures. With the departure of his focus of meditation, assisted by the outside energy of expanded consciousness, the Bainini returns to his normal, conflicted self, harboring urges for both self-gratification and devotion to God. However, this does not mean to say that Bainini loses his self-control and actually follows any of these urges. As far as his external self is concerned, in thought, speech, and action, the Bainini has achieved total self-mastery. Remember, Tanya has spent so much time telling us there is an external self and an internal self. That's why it's so hard to judge people, right? We, we see this in life, by the way. We see people, we see how they act, and we judge them based on what we see. We don't know what's going on inside. There's the external, and there's the internal. We see, oh, that person has it easy. That person has, uh, it's so easy for them, right? Or uh, just the, a more crude example, right? You see people on the outside, you don't see them in their homes, what goes on in their homes. You know, there's the, their external self and what's internally going on in their families, in their homes. And we make judgments based on people's external selves. The Tanya tells us, can never really know what's going on. All you can see is the external self, the actions. The Bainini, though, has no control over his internal self, meaning, I shouldn't say no control, does not have complete control. As he says, only since this evil on the left side of the heart is not the only ruling power prevailing over the small city, the evil is unable to bring its desire to fruition, to influence the body's part in action or speech, or in a substantive thought. The fact that the Baini can hold back from acting and his desires or speaking about them makes sense since we are all in direct control over what we do and say. But if the Baini has experienced the urge for self-gratification, it must also have entered his thoughts, which are not in a person's full control. How then can the Tanya claim the Baini's success in withholding his desires even from thoughts? The Tanya indicated the answer to this question by stressing the Bainini succeeds only refraining from substantive thought, namely, from allowing his thoughts to dwell in the pleasure of this world that satisfies his heart desire. So again, this explains what I said earlier. There are urges. We have to remember not to judge ourselves by our urges that come into our mind. We're judged by if we decide to wallow in them. That's how we are judged. And uh, that is not the uh, page. Probably have to... Um, let me see if I took a copy of that. Oh, we're on page 142, right? So we need 143. You know, we're getting up to a topic that I really was hoping we would cover today, but I'm not sure it's, it is possible. And so I had these two articles up. Um, and it, it really gets to the core of self-mastery and, and the Bainini self-mastery. Um. It's really relevant, and I want to give it the time that it deserves. So um, I'm not sure I'm going to get into it, so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm just going to end this section over here. Okay, let's take a look here. The Bainini cannot stop the urge for self-gratification from entering his mind. What he can do is refrain from intentionally drawing in such thoughts, i.e. having substantive thoughts by diverting his mind to something else, as we will discuss further on. Now he's going to ask, which we're going to answer next week. Still a self-mastery, the Bainini is difficult to understand. If he harbors the desire for self-gratification in his soul, surely at some point his desires will eventually overcome him. How can we be assured that every occasion he will not allow his mind to dwell on these urges or to act on them in any way? And that is what we're going to discover next week. It's a something called the mind rules over the heart. It's something, it's a line that is quoted often in the Tanya. It causes a lot of people heartache as well. Because it kind of makes it sound like, well, if you just want it, you'll you'll get to do it, right? We tell people all the time, well, if you just want it, you'll do it, right? And uh, we find many people have very difficult, a lot of difficulty controlling themselves. And um, so people really try to understand what this means. You know, I mean, how many self help books are there out there trying to help us uh, get? To where we want to go on the tanya kind of makes it sound like a very simple rule mind rules over the heart if you want it you'll do it so we'll we'll discover that at length in next week like i said i don't i didn't want to um i didn't want to um lose sight of that this week uh i'm sorry we really need to spend time talking about it um someone's writing here to an extent that bainley is more impressive than exotic um, the Tanya will describe 
it's a good point. You're saying because that the, the tzaddik does not um, have to war with its animalistic soul. First of all, you might be right. Second of all, the Tanya is going to describe later what's what's really desired for us in life. It, uh, second of all, I'll say, I actually don't know what a tzaddik really does, right? Once a tzaddik vanquishes their evil inclination, what type of struggles do they have? They might have struggles that are godly. So it's hard for me to say 100% yes, but definitely one can look at it and say, yes, the Bainini on face value looks like they have the harder job and uh, possibly is very true. The Tanya will later on describe that God has different pleasures. God has a pleasure from a Bainini, from the struggle, and God has pleasure from a tzaddik. And the Tanya brings an example. It says, for example, uh, there's different types of foods. There are foods that are naturally sweet, right? We like uh, a donut. But there are other foods that are not naturally sweet, but in a sense, taste even better. And so he compares that to a tzaddik is naturally sweet. But a bainani, someone who struggles, is another type of sweetness, like taking a, a food that's not naturally sweet and making it taste so delicious, savory and yummy and, and whatever else it is. Ghost peppers, for those who like those. Um, but what do we have from here? What we want to walk away from with today is number one, is that even if we don't have the ability to change our inner core, which we probably don't, we do have the ability for some level of self-mastery. We're going to discover some more keys throughout the Tanya to gain our self-mastery, but we always have to know that just because our inner core and our desires are bad does not mean we have to act upon them. The Tanya will later on tell us how to set ourselves up for better success, as I'm sure you may know some of these ideas. And one of those ideas of success we already discussed this week was moments of clarity, moments of prayer. We need to take those moments of prayer, those moments of clarity, and allow ourselves to uh, give ourselves the right commitment and, and fuel to do what is right. And finally, I want to point out that based on today's discussion, you can understand how a Bainani, someone who is an intermediate person, can confuse themselves for being a tzaddik, as we'll describe later, that a Bainani, an intermediate person, when he's praying, can confuse himself for a tzaddik, because a Bainani during prayer is like a tzaddik, right? Number one, the Bainani never sins. Number two, this Bainini now has complete self-mastery over their evil inclination during prayer. And this explains the question we had in the beginning of the Tanya. How could a righteous man like Rabbah think that he is a Bainini intermediate person now that we understand an intermediate person never sins and during prayer they may feel like it's Adik. Rabbah may have felt that he was just an always inspired guy, but deep down he had an evil inclination. But you, You're getting the idea now how we from the outside can confuse a Bainani with a tzaddik. Until Tanya's explanation, it didn't make sense. How can you confuse a fully righteous person with someone who's an in-betweener? Now we understand an in-betweener is not so in-between. The in-betweener is someone who never sins. So now I can see how I could confuse a in-betweener with a tzaddik. But again, that is all for the intellectual thesis for the Tanya. It's not so important to us. What's really important to us is to know that uh, this idea of the Bainani can apply to us that we can have control over ourselves even when we have a bad inner core. And that's going to be our life's work. And we have moments where we can inspire ourselves. Um, I'm going to stop here. Again, I would have loved to uh, love to do the next section, but there really wasn't enough time. So I am going to leave the mind rules over the heart for next week. Uh, thank you. And uh, you're all welcome.